Hello again. This is Alex Rohde with National Defense Studies. Today we're going to talk about ham radio operators and why they're so important to emergency communications and how you can become one. So, come with me. The Titanic was a British luxury liner, the largest ship of her time. Commanded by Captain John Edward Smith, she set sail on her maiden voyage in early April of 1912 with 2,224 passengers and crew aboard. The Titanic was magnificent with its grand staircase, fine restaurants, and well-appointed cabins. It also had a powerful wireless telegraph capable of reaching both sides of the Atlantic and provided for the use of the passengers as well as the crew. Pictured here is a reproduction of the radio equipment on board the Titanic. On the fateful night of April 14, 1912, as the Titanic steamed across the North Atlantic, another ship, the USS Californian, commanded by Captain Stanley Lord, was only a short distance away. Captain Lord had ordered the Californian to stop for the night because of the large amount of icebergs in the area. He also ordered his radio operator, Cyril Evans, to warn all surrounding ships in the area, which Evans proceeded to do. But meanwhile, back on the Titanic, its radio equipment had broken down earlier in the day. Once the equipment was fixed, radio operators Jack Phillips and Harold Bribe were busy trying to relay the resulting backlog of messages from Titanic's passengers to Cape Race, Newfoundland, 800 miles away. When Evans sent the message from the Californian that, quote, we are stopped and surrounded by ice, the Titanic was so close that the transmission was almost deafening, interfering with the Newfoundland transmission and causing Phillips to snap back to Evans, shut up, shut up, I am busy, I am working Cape Race. Back on the Californian, Evans waited a little while longer and then switched off the radio for the night. Ten minutes later, the Titanic struck an iceberg. Although the Californian was nearby, it did not receive the frantic distress signals because its radio operator was now off duty. It was almost four hours later when the first rescue ship arrived, two hours after the Titanic had already sunk. Those lucky enough to be in lifeboats were pulled to safety, but it was too late for those left on board. The sinking of the Titanic shocked the world. Out of 2,228 passengers and crew aboard the Titanic, only 705 survived. Subsequent investigations revealed how a better organized radio system might have saved more lives. This led to the passage of the Radio Act of 1912, which, among other things, formalized the amateur radio service. Today, amateur radio is regulated by the Federal Communications Commission, or the FCC as it is commonly called, and is widely recognized and respected as the voluntary, non-commercial communication service, particularly with respect to providing emergency communications. It is recognized worldwide for its critical role in emergency communications, as well as its innovative contributions to radio technology and operations. For the past hundred years, ham radio operators, as they are informally known, have provided a vital communications link to first responders and private citizens alike. Even when disaster destroys or overwhelms our modern cell phones, landlines, and internet communications, ham radios still continue to transmit life-saving information. So why do ham radios continue to operate when all else fails? It is because of their unique capabilities. Commercial communication systems require massive infrastructure, such as towers, switchers, and landlines, which are all vulnerable to physical destruction during earthquakes, hurricanes, and other powerful forces of nature. Because ham radio operations do not require this extensive infrastructure, they are much more survivable during a disaster. Also, ham radio equipment can operate on batteries and generators, and therefore is not reliant on the power grid, which is also vulnerable during disasters. Ham radios can be as small as a cell phone or installed in a vehicle for mobile operations, making them especially useful in unpredictable and fluid situations. Unlike cell phone communication, which is designed to be point-to-point, -point, ham radio is designed to be multi-to-multi, -multi, especially useful in a group situation when information needs to be shared on a real-time basis among the members. In recognition 
Of Amateur Radio's critical role in emergency communications, the FCC has reserved 26 amateur radio bands for use by licensed hams. Because these bands of frequencies are not open to the public, they are far less likely to be overwhelmed by excessive use, unlike cell phone operations. Amateur Radio is also an integrated partner in the emergency response community, working closely with local, state, and federal authorities, as well as private organizations, to rapidly and effectively respond to crisis. There are almost 700,000 ham radio operators in the United States alone, and almost 2 million worldwide. So when disaster strikes, a ham will most likely already be living inside the disaster area, ready to provide immediate and critical communications. From the weekly Sunday night nets to exchanging QSL cards and participating in radio contests, hams have a culture of staying ready by staying connected. No ham operator is isolated so long as he has his radio, and no community isolated so long as it has its ham radio operator. A powerful advocate is the Amateur Radio Relay League, or simply ARRL. It lobbies, advises, assists, trains, and educates on behalf of the amateur radio community. It publishes many books and a monthly membership journal called the QST. So hopefully by now you're asking yourself how you can become a ham radio operator. Well, there are three simple steps. First of all, you get the amateur radio license by taking a test. To make it easier, all the possible questions and their right answers are provided free of charge at www.ncvec.org forward slash downloads forward slash capital revised percentage two zero capital element percentage two zero two dot pdf. Local amateur radio clubs also offer free classes for the entry-level technician as well as the more advanced general and extra class licenses. Find the schedule of classes nearest to you at www.arrl.org forward slash find hyphen and hyphen amateur hyphen radio hyphen license hyphen class. You can get a free study guide with links to helpful practice tests at www.kb6nu.com forward slash tech hyphen manual. Also, ARRL publishes a very helpful ham radio license manual and practice exam software that you can purchase at www.arrl.org forward slash licensing hyphen education hyphen training. Please email me if you have any questions. And finally, don't worry about learning everything all at once. Just get your license. You have a whole lifetime to learn all that amateur radio has to offer. After you get your license, get an Elmer. In the ham world, Elmers are more experienced hams who mentor the newer hams to help them get started. It's part of the culture of staying connected. So don't think you will ever have to learn everything by yourself. There is a whole network of hams standing by. Finally, get involved. There are local amateur radio clubs throughout the United States. You can find the one closest to you by checking the ARRL website at www.arrl.org forward slash find hyphen a hyphen club and typing in your zip code. Local clubs offer much in the way of support, providing Elmer's information on local ham radio and other volunteer activities and hosting regular nets where hams can check in, test their equipment, and get the latest important information. So, get started today! Well, that's it for now. Thanks so much for joining me. This is Alex W3JAG signing off.